Um, um, it is always a pleasure to be here at home in Baltimore. Um, we have, what, an hour and 15 minutes? Or what's the session? Yeah, about that. So um, you can feel free to interrupt me if you like. Can you all hear me? I, I have a lapel mic, but I think it goes to a video camera, so, um, but not to you. So let me know if you can't hear. Um, so the, the title of the talk includes a couple of words that everybody in the room, I presume, knows, language and evolution, and a phrase that's probably familiar to most of you, but just as an initial um, check on, on people's background in linguistics and, and perhaps in linguistic orthodoxy, how many people here know the term explanatory adequacy? Don't be shy if you don't know it, but how many people are familiar with that? Okay, that's fine. Um, so um, the, the, the phrase explanatory adequacy comes from, from Noam Chomsky, and what he was getting at is that there's sort of two ways you can do linguistics, kind of an easy way and a hard way. Um, the easy way is you can describe the, the superficial phenomena in the language, um, and the hard way is you can try to figure out why the, the, they are the way they are. So he, here's my gloss on, on what Chomsky said. A good linguistic theory ought to cover the data. Um, it ought to be able to, for example, give you a grammar of English or whatever language you might be looking at. But a great linguistic theory would do more than that. It wouldn't just be a recitation of the rules that describe the language. Um, it would explain why the data have the character that they do, why the language has the properties that it, that it does. And one, one way in which he's put this is there's a space of possible languages. And among that space of possible languages is a, is a set of human languages. You might think of the set of actual human languages, and there might be a cloud around them of possible human languages. And clearly, that's distinct from, for example, computer programming languages, from mathematics. There are other kinds of languages you can learn if you have too much time on your hands, like the Klingon language. I'm told that there's a summer immersion course. You could be doing that instead of um, learning how speech actually works if, if you had such inclination. So um, the, the, the point is that human languages are form just some subset of the possible languages. And a really good linguist, I, I'm not sure about having this stick in my hands. It seems kind of dangerous. I'll just put it aside. Um, a really good linguist would um, have a way of saying why, why we fit into the space of possible languages as we do. Um, and obviously, there are going to be a lot of different factors that are going to contribute to any answer about why human languages have the structure that they do. One thing that has become popular lately are the, maybe I'll use this pointer just because it seems like so much fun, this yardstick. There are the quasi-logical requirements of, of um, Noam Chomsky's recent work. How many people here have heard um, the phrase virtual conceptual necessity? It's become very popular in certain quarters of linguistics, evidently not in this quarter of um, linguistics. That's OK. But um, in some quarters, which are, of course, centered around Cambridge, Massachusetts, but do extend outwards from there, um, there is this idea that you might be able to basically derive the structure of language from having a few basic principles, what Chomsky calls virtual conceptual necessity. Um, it's a sort of perhaps poor choice of phrase, but the idea is if you had a language, the, these are the things that you could more or less take for granted. Um, for example, presumably a language more or less would have to interf interface with your conceptual system. It's not quite a logical necessity that a language do so. You could imagine maybe some creature that would have a linguistic system that didn't communicate with the conceptual system so the creature could think about the world, but it couldn't talk about the world and it couldn't talk about what it thinks about. But that would be so sort of besides the point that, that we might as well say, yeah, for all practical purposes, any language um, that's worth talking about would have a way of relating to the conceptual system of the underlying creature. So that's what Chomsky means by virtual conceptual necessity. Another example is, yeah, you could imagine a language that had no way of interfacing with the outside world. But again, you know, we barely even want to use the word language for that. So virtual conceptual necessity holds that you have a conceptual system. You have an output system, which might be, for example, speech that you guys, a lot of you are um, uh, studying. And then Chomsky's goal is to see how much of the rest of the structure of language, the idiosyncrasies of syntax, the way that semantics works, how phonology works, and so forth, could be derived from these basic facts. So if some of you are familiar with physics and what people have been trying to do in like the last 20 years in physics, where they try to have grand unified theories where they derive physics from some smaller set of basic principles, and then you derive everything else you need to know, the, the intention here is similar, that you would derive the content of linguistics um, starting with these kind of basic operating principles. Of course, there are other things that clearly are going to constrain what a language is. For example, physical requirements. So um, complex thoughts presumably have to be rammed down a serial channel. It's probably 
you know, you could imagine, um, again, if you're a Klingon fan, you could imagine Vulcan mind melds in which all of your thoughts would transfer instantaneously with the single application of a hand in just the right physical configuration. Um, but we presume that that's the work of science fiction. In reality, it's presumably it's a physical constraint. You're going to have to take your internal idea that might be represented in some hierarchical, structural way. Maybe there's parallel representation and so forth. You're going to have to stick it in a serial channel. There's going to be limits on the rate of information transition, uh, transmission. I try to talk so fast that I approach that limit on information transmission. Um, but clearly, there is such a limit that's going to have something to do with language. Um, then there are, in, from a totally different tradition in linguistics, there's another set of constraints that you might um, imagine to be important. Um, things that Chomsky doesn't really talk about at all, but cognitive linguists like to talk about, like distinctiveness, clarity, effectiveness. So for example, you could imagine, if, if you're again comfortable with the science fiction, a language in which there were say 100,000 utterances for 100,000 different thoughts, but it would be straight out of a Douglas Adams novel. All of those 10,000 um, or 100,000 ideas would be expressed with the same um, vocalization, which we'll say is gin and tonics, right? So you'd say gin and tonics for everything. I think this was an actual example in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Presumably, evolutionary pressure would be such that there would be an adaptive advantage for some creature that could manage to have at least two distinct sounding utterances as opposed to one. And you might iterate that argument and think that you know having more distinct utterances is better than fewer. Any language where um, you couldn't be clear when you wanted to be clear, presumably you know, would lose out to languages where people had the option of clarity and so forth. I'm going to talk about a different kind of constraint. My focus is really going to be on the one at the bottom, phylogenetic constraints. And it's OK if you don't have any idea what I mean by that. I will come back to it. Um, I don't want to say that any of these things are wrong. I don't want to um, challenge anybody who says that it must be the case, for example, that the nature of language has over evolutionary time been shaped by the fact that languages need to be distinct or by the fact that they need to interface with conceptual systems. I think everything sort of above this line is all true. I don't want to doubt any of it. But I want to say something's been left out of the way in which people have thought about questions like what is language, how did it evolve, and so forth. So just a few more words on Chomsky's perspective. As I said, he wants to derive things from virtual conceptual necessity. And I think this goes hand in hand with a kind of perfectionistic kind of claim. And, and Richard kind of gave away um, you know, half of my story in, in the last sentence of his introduction because he kind of hinted that I'm going to argue against this. But so um, Chomsky has been lately writing sentences like these. Some language comes close to what some super engineer would construct. Um, it appears to be very well designed, perhaps close to being perfect and satisfying external conditions. In other words, given that you have your conceptual system, your output system, you can derive the rest, right? I mean, you can see how um, these two notions of perfection or near perfection and virtual conceptual necessity kind of go together, or at least. I mean, I'm not saying they logically must go together, but there's a reason why that um, one person might believe these kinds of things. If you read the technical um, literature in this area of linguistics, and since not that many of you recognize the phrase virtual conceptual necessity, I'm guessing these kinds of phrases aren't that familiar. But in the domain that Chomsky works in, namely syntax, um, you typically see things like this. And it doesn't matter if you can't follow every detail of what I've got up. Um, but I, this is an extract from one of his papers. And he says, the optimal computational procedures consist then of operation merge and operations to construct the displacement property. So the idea, without going into the details of what merge is and what a displacement property is and so forth, the, the basic idea here is that language is some optimal solution um, that's using certain kinds of computational tools in, in, in really um, efficient or something like that kinds of ways. Now, um, one reason you might believe this, although oddly it's not Chomsky's reason, um, is you might think that evolution would have a hand in producing an optimal system. I will say, um, to be clear, I don't think that Chomsky thinks that the reason that the language system might be optimal is because of any particular facts about evolutionary psychology. I think a number of other people find his ideas appealing because of a way in which they imagine that evolution and linguistics and so forth might go together. I think for Chomsky, it's purely an aesthetic thing or a mathematical thing, or as I said, like in physics, where you're trying to derive things from least principles. But um, another very well-known person working in language happens to have been my graduate advisor, Steven Pinker, um, has written stuff like this um, over the last few years. This is from his book, How the Mind Works. And he says, the parts of the mind that allow us to see are indeed well engineered. This is early in his very well-known book, How the Mind Works. And the argument there is that human vision is much better than machine vision. And 
probably for another five, ten years, you'd be able to make that argument. Probably at some point, you won't be able to anymore. I heard this wonderful example the other day um, of how things might change in our legal systems and so forth eventually. At some point, computer vision will exceed ours. At some point, computer drivers will be better drivers than human drivers. And it will reach a point where it might be criminally negligent to drive your own car rather than to allow a machine <laughs> to do that. But for now, that is not true. right? For now, I would rather drive in the back of a taxi in Manhattan by someone who barely speaks English, has only been in the United States for six months, because I still trust that that person's visual system is better than any machine, that they're better going to be able to pick out what's a bicycle, what's a shadow, what's another taxi cab, and so forth. So our visual systems are very good. And Pinker starts with that assumption. He says, um, well, if the parts of the mind that allow us to see are well engineered, well, there's no reason, and this is where you should reach for your wallet, he says, there is no reason to think that the quality of engineering progressively deteriorates as the information flows upstream to the faculties that interpret and act on what we see. And presumably language would be one of those um, things. I want to argue that there's actually a very good reason to think that something like language might not be as well engineered as something like vision. I'll get there in a moment. Um, I have a bunch of quotes from the technical literature. Um, I won't go through them in detail, but um, one buzzword that um, is probably familiar to a lot of people working in speech is, is, is the notion of Bayesian decision theory. So it's become very popular in cognitive science to think that maybe what the mind is, sorry about that, um, what the mind is is basically a big machine for doing Bayesian computation. And I think there is a partial truth in there, which is I think the mind can do Bayesian computation, but I think it's a really misleading way of thinking about what the mind as a whole does. And I'll at least allude to some of that today. My, my new book is, is, is largely about that. Um, but so it's very popular in cognitive sciences right now to imagine the mind as, as this sort of Bayesian inference a, engine. And I think a lot of the reason for it is evolutionary psychology. This is a quote from John Tooby and Lita Cosmides, who were um, the, the founders of the field evolutionary psychology. And um, here's how they put it. Because natural selection is a hill climbing process, and you've probably all heard that metaphor about evolution, that evolution is climbing hills gradually, um, it tends to, that tends to choose the best of the variant designs that actually appear. And because of the immense numbers of alternatives that appear over the vast expanse of evolutionary time, we'll come back to that in a second, natural selection tends to cause cause the accumulation of superlatively well-engineered functional designs. And I think this is kind of like a background working assumption, not always explicit, often implicit, um, for a lot of people in their approach to cognitive science. Certainly not for all. There are other traditions in cognitive science. But for a lot of people, and I think especially recently with um, Bayesian stuff becoming as popular as it is, a lot of people just assume that their cell phone should be turned off, especially when they give a lecture. Um, a lot of people assume. Um, that everything must be optimal. And yet, here you have nincompoops giving public lectures without remembering to put on their cell phones. So, um, so there is this tradition of people, um, uh, this is especially funny when you see the next slide, I guess. There is this tradition of people thinking um, that the mind is optimal, that language might be optimal. And yet, as Groucho and Marx said, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes, right? I mean, there are counterexamples. <laughs> where people do not seem to be doing Bayesian inference and do not seem to be you know, reliably making computations from, from the data to reality. <laughs> um, and it's not just him. It's people who forget to turn off their cell phones and so forth. It's especially the people who re-elected him, 70% um, <laughs> of whom thought that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq a year and a half after we went in and didn't find a trace of them, which I mean, leads to questions like, does the human mind suffer from confirmation bias? I think the evidence for that is robust. Confirmation bias is you go into something, you have a prior idea. If something confirms that idea, you love it. If it doesn't, you pick holes at it, or you ignore it, or you forget it, and so forth. I have a whole story about why that might exist that, that I discussed um, in the new book. But um, suffice to say that a real genuine Bayesian um, system that was optimal and so forth probably would be better at, at going from data like there are no weapons of mass destruction to, or there none have been found to the inferences about whether they exist. Um, and I don't think that um, when you actually go out there and look at human nature, whether you're looking at the reasoning kinds of stuff that Kahneman and Tversky has talked about or whatever, I, I don't think it's actually reasonable to assume that the mind, you know, as your default, that the mind is an optimal system. So what gives? How do we reconcile the supposed power of evolution with the manifest clumsiness of the human mind? Um, well, the first thing is when Tubi and Cosmides talk about the vast expanses of time, I think that it's really important to recognize that we have different time scales for different aspects of the mind. 
So vision is a system that's really old. It, there's an evolutionary history for vision that goes back well over 500 million years, close to a billion years. When we're talking about language or deliberate reasoning, the kind of you know, inference that people make about weapons of mass destruction and so forth, where they're consciously reflecting and so forth, um, those kinds of things are more like 100,000 years old. So I mean, there's debate in the archaeological record about how far language goes back and language d languages don't give fossils. But I think a pretty common estimate is that language 50,000 or 100,000 years. So there are three orders of magnitude difference in how long um, nature has had to blindly work out the bugs in vision as opposed to in language. Um, and what's new obviously may not be as fully debugged as that which is older. This is the first problem, I think, with this kind of assumption of, of optimality or presumption of optimality. The second problem is that evolution has no foresight. People talk about this notion of evolution as hill climber. And it's sort of right, but it's often sort of spun in a way that's missing a major wrinkle in the whole plan. So it is true that if you have some simple trait, um, that it may simply get better and better, whatever that means, more and more adapted um, in some environment over time. So for example, the sensitivity of the retina to light has gradually increased over time such to the point that we have eyes that are sensitive to a single photon of light in a darkened room. You can't do any better than that. So in terms of, you know, if, if peak sensitivity to light is there at the top of the mountain, we have gotten to the top of the mountain at that particular trait. So it's a fine metaphor to say that basically, does anybody know Michael Pollan's um, re recent thing about eat food, mostly vegetables, not too much? So I, I was thinking about that the other day. And evolution is sort of take small steps, um, mostly gradual, don't go down. That's basically the algorithm of evolution. You take these little tiny steps, and, and you find yourself at the top of the mountain by following the simple algorithm. But there's always um, a catch. The catch is that the terrain of evolution, the landscape of evolution, doesn't always look like Mount Fuji that we had on the previous slide. So if you follow this algorithm of only take little small steps up, never go down, and you're on Mount Fuji, you will eventually get to the top of the mountain, especially if you can wait a few billion years. On the other hand, if you do that in the Himalayas, you're very likely to find yourself at the top of some mountain that's well below um, uh, the tree line, well below the snow line. Right? So you could easily, if you follow that, you get into what a mathematician would call a local maximum. You have a system or you're, you're on a peak, you're higher than, than the immediate surround, but there are much higher peaks that, that could have been imagined. And if you're a blind system, and evolution is surely the product of what D Dawkins called a blind watchmaker, it's a blind process, um, you're vulnerable to this problem of local maxima. And empirically, I mean, again, it's a sort of Groucho Marx thing, who are you going to believe me or your own eyes? Feel your own spine. You know, does your back hurt or does it ever hurt? Well, if it does, it probably didn't need to, right? So if um, evolution were an intelligent designer, which strangely, you know, 30% or 50%, depending on the numbers, or 70% of your country people believe, um, if evolution was the product of intelligent designer, then you could sort of imagine, okay, well, here I am, God, and I have created a whole lot of four-legged creatures that are really cool. There is the elephant. I recently saw the baby elephant in the Baltimore Zoo. You should all go and see it if you haven't already, because there are very few ba baby elephants that you can see in the world. Um, so, um, you know, God might have said, I made the elephants, and I made the lions, and the zebras, and the giraffes, and, and this is all really great, but I want to make a two-legged creature. How should I go about that? And if, if, if this hypothetical god had any sense whatsoever, they would say, well, the physics of two-legged creatures might be different from the physics of four-legged creatures, or the structural considerations maybe would be a more accurate way to say it. So in a four-legged creature, how do you support the body weight? Well, you have this plank, and the plank, the spine, a single column, distributes the load across um, the creature. It's a pretty good design. It's pretty simple. Um, we use it for park benches all the time. That's great. Um, if you did the simplest, cheapest thing, well, you would just rotate that 90 degrees, but you would say to yourself, that would sort of give me a flagpole. Well, what are flagpoles good for? Flags. But I want to build, <laughs> I want to build a creature that has a big, heavy skull. I want to make this creature smart. And so if you used a single column, you'd wind up having a single column that doesn't distribute the load, that supports 70% of the body weight of this creature, and this creature would always have back trouble. You would say, no, 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 I'm going to use four columns, shock absorbers. I'm going to you know, make this creature a happy creature. But obviously, there is no designer, and we're stuck with this, right? So um, this is what engineers would call a kludge. It's a solution that gets the job done, but it's not particularly an ideal solution. So yes, a single column 
frees up our hands, that's had profound um, influences. We're better off having that than not, but it could have been a lot better with even the tiniest bit of foresight. Um, here's just one more example of a kludge, because it's a concept that I like a lot. Um, <laughs> Clumsy and elegant, but good enough. It doesn't help the driver of this vehicle on the dating market. I'm presuming he can't go around saying, I have a slick ride, go out with me, but his car is cool, right? Okay. So evolution builds kludges for, for a different set of reasons. Um, I mean, not because the guy couldn't, you know, I mean, this guy built this because he couldn't afford to have a proper air conditioner installed in his car, and this was a cheaper solution. Um, evolution builds kludges. Already I have illustrated at length the problem of lack of foresight. Evolution also has no hindsight. It can't say, I built this human species. They're really cool in a lot of ways. They have language, and that's neat. But there are problems with the language, like their sentences are often ambiguous, which you know they don't really need to be if, if you had designed it from scratch. And they're way too aggressive against one another. They're way too competitive. So there are you know, nice things about these species. But let me just change a few. Right? Evolution can't do that. It doesn't have hindsight. Um, and it's always in a hurry. It can't take the species offline. Right? You can't say, we're going to release humans 2.0 after you know, a three-year <laughs> OK. So. All right. So instead, what evolution is forced to do, it, it, it's, the pressure is always online. right? It's always a matter of which genes are leading to which creatures that survive and reproduce. Um, and so evolution always builds stuff out of spare parts, basically, as a consequence. You have what's called descent with modification. Evolution takes what's there, and it tinkers with it. So Darwin is famous for the phrase, survival of the fittest. Um, there are two things you should know about that phrase. One is Darwin didn't actually coin it. And the second is that that's an example of ambiguous language. People take it to mean survival of the fittest possible thing that you could imagine, that you're always going to be at the top of the mountain. But all it means is the fittest among the available choices. And the available choices depend on a complex probability of genotype, phenotype mapping, how genes mutate, what's likely to survive, and so forth. Not necessarily the fittest possible uh, solution. The human spine is a good example of that. OK, so the consequence is that evolution is like a tinker. This is a quote from Francois Jacob that I can't seem to give a lecture without citing, because I think it su has such profound implications for how we should think about um, the mind. Um, he says, evolution is like a tinker who, without, who often, without knowing what he's going to produce, uses whatever he finds around him, old cardboards, pieces of string, fragments of wood or metal, to make some kind of workable object, which is kind of like the workshop my dad had on Guilford Avenue when I grew up um, a few blocks away from here. Um, my dad was always too lazy to go to the hardware store to buy what he needed when he could you know, make it out of duct tape and, and a coat hanger and, and so forth. And that's kind of what evolution does. Um, so I'd like to give you one, one sort of bit of jargon today, um, a phrase that I'll call evolutionary inertia. I guess I'll have another bit of jargon in a moment. Um, evolutionary inertia is um, an idea that I'm modeling on Newton's notion of inertia. So Newton's notion of inertia is an object that's at rest tends to stay at rest. Um, an object that's in motion tends to continue in motion. Well, evolution has very much the same property. Once it's going in a particular direction, it's very difficult for evolution to just sort of change course. right? So it's not impossible that some descendant of human beings could have a four-column spinal design or something like that. But you would need a lot of mutations to happen at the same time in order to make that work. Um, what is more likely um, among the landscape of evolution is that you're going to get gradual changes. Um, so you're going to tend to continue in particular directions, even if those directions are not optimal to particular problems. OK. Now, the idea that evolution might build kludges is itself not new. Um, seen the phrase once or twice in the literature. Um, I don't think the term has been used in quite that way. But the idea of evolution not exactly being an optimizer, but what Herb Simon called a satisficer, something that makes things that are good enough, has certainly been around. Um, Stephen Jay Gould is maybe the person who I think enjoyed these examples the most or did the most to popularize them. Um, he, his famous example was the panda's thumb. The panda. Um, the, quote, thumb of a panda is actually an extended um, wrist bone. It's not a very good way of stripping the bark of bamboo. Um, it's what Gould would call a remnant of the past that doesn't make sense. You, you could have designed it better. And he says, instead, these things tell you something about the signs of history. But Gould wasn't a psychologist. If he were a psychologist, the first thing he would have noted is you have these creatures that sit around. They will eat nothing but bamboo no matter what else is around. They will go to no end of trouble. This is a mind kludge that makes the, the, the panda stuck on eating only this 
this one particular source of, of, of food. And the general point that I want to make is although the notion that evolution might produce things that are suboptimal is not exactly brand new to biology, it really hasn't been taken seriously enough in either psychology or in linguistics. And what I want to do today is, is to try to persuade you that um, even in the domain of linguistics, which Chomsky has said is, you know, we should expect to be near to optimal, that there's actually some, some um, traction we can get by thinking about how evolutionary inertia might have shaped linguistics. So I'm going to give you one sort of worked out case study today. I have some others in, in, in your book. But I'm going to give you one uh, case study today of a property of language or a set of properties of language that I think derive basically from the kind of evolutionary accident that Gould liked to talk about, a kind of pandas thumb of language. Okay. Um, I'll talk a little bit about, well, I'll talk a lot, rather, about linguistic performance, a little bit about linguistic competence at the end. I'm not sure everybody here knows the distinction because you're, you're not from the linguistic background that I thought you were. I guess you're, you're more on the speech side. Um, the, the traditional distinction here is performance is sort of what happens in day-to-day -day computation. Competence is like the abstract knowledge that underlies the performance or something like that. Um, come back to that. Anyway, I'm mostly going to talk about one particular aspect of language that I assume pretty much everybody in the room is familiar with, even if you're not working in syntax, which is the syntactic tree, which is the basic currency of a lot of linguistics, or certainly of almost all of the linguistics of, um, in syntax and in parsing um, the grammatical structures of sentences. If you were to build a machine parser, I think there is no doubt that this would be your fundamental unit of representation. You would want syntactic trees. The point of syntactic trees is you have large bits of structure, say a sentence, that are composed of smaller reusable bits of structure like noun phrases and verb phrases. And you um, decompose things successively into smaller and smaller pieces, verbs, um, noun phrases, and, and, and so forth. Um, what I'm going to try to do is to argue that although this would be the ideal format of representation, um, for a linguistic system, that nature didn't actually come up with it in quite the um, pristine and powerful form that computer scientists did, and that that was kind of a mistake on the part of evolution. Um, the linguistic system that we actually have is basically a kludged version of this, that we don't actually have mentally realized representations of syntactic trees as useful as they might have otherwise been. Everybody got that? So I'm going to give the examples in a minute and try to make that argument. That's where I'm going. So are you talking about I am. I mean, I'm mostly going to give you comprehension data with one brief bit of pr production data, but I believe it to be true of both. Um, and you can come back to that later if you, um, after I've sort of developed the argument some. Um, OK, so the specific focus, the form of the argument that I'm going to make, I've kind of already given you, but the, the specific content is I'm going to try to argue that there's something about the nature of our memory systems um, as they have evolved over a billion years that is incompatible with linguistic representation as um, we would ideally like to have it. Um, but that we're stuck with it. That is an example of evolutionary inertia. So um, the logical structure of the argument, something old, something new, what's been borrowed and, and what that might tell us. So the something old is the structure of human memory. Um, and it's not just the structure of human memory. It's really the structure of biological memory. So I don't know if you guys have read much evolutionary psychology. People sometimes hearken back to like what it was like for our Stone Age ancestors or something like that. And they say, you know, our, in, in the Stone Age, our ancestors um, couldn't get enough fat or sugar, so we walk into McDonald's and our brains go nuts because here are these things that weren't available in the Stone Age and we were too. Um, I, I think that argument's probably actually true. I think it lies in part, you know, part of the explanation for why McDonald's has done as well as it, for itself as it has is put a lot of sugar in its fries. But, um, I want to go much further back. I want to talk about a property of the human mind that wasn't just shaped over the time in which our ancestors were in the savanna, if that's in fact where they were, um, but that's been shaped by a billion years of evolution and hence an enormous amount of evolutionary inertia. And this is the fact that the way that our memory is addressed is very different from the way that computers address memories. Most of you are probably pretty familiar with how computers work. I'm not sure all of you are. I'll give you one basic fact in a moment. But in computers, everything, I'll give it to you now. So everything in a computer is organized by location. Everything is stored in a particular spot. I'll, I'll elaborate on that thought in a moment. Our memories aren't, don't work that way. We don't retrieve stuff by saying, I want the contents of memory location number 3217 or something like that. We say, I want something that reminds me of this kind of circumstance. We may not do it consciously, or sometimes maybe we do. This has all kinds of interesting consequences. For example, if you train somebody 
um, on a list of words while they are underwater, which if you ask me is an odd time to learn a list of words. Um, and they are busy there, hopefully remembering to breathe because they've got this tube. And you, know. um, you train them on this list of words, and then you ask them a few days later, do they remember this list of words? It turns out you don't have to say anything, but if you just happen to test them underwater, that will help them to remember the list of words because being underwater is a reminder of the list of words. It's one of the many cues many bits of context that help us to retrieve the information that we need. If you pull them out of the water and you test them on land, they won't remember as well. As someone who doesn't like scuba diving, I find that peculiar, since I feel more comfortable thinking about just about anything while I'm actually on the ground. But that's just me. Anyways, it turns out that the context in which you learn something matters. Your posture matters. You're all sitting down right now. If you try to remember what I said later while you were swimming or standing up, you probably wouldn't quite remember it as well as if you were in an overchilled air-conditioned room with no windows and, and sitting down. Um, it turns out that this is true of every creature that has ever been studied as far as I know. I don't know of any counterexamples. Not every creature has been studied, but I'm willing to wager a guess that you will find this phenomena. Sometimes people call it context-dependent memory. Um, in any creature, whether you're talking about snails or mice or what have you. So very general property of the human mind as compared to these computer chips that, that we have come to rely on so much. And these are sort of old fashioned and much bigger than the eight gigabyte chip that I have in a tiny piece of my cell phone. Um, but they work by location, as I said. So um, the way that computer memory works, probably I don't need this silly metaphor for you guys, but, but bear with me for another second, is it's like a whole set of safe deposit boxes, right? Every bit of information belongs in a particular um, uh, particular box, which is groovy because if you leave something in the box, in the memory location, it stays there. You can count on having it later. So I put Justin's phone number in my cell phone the last time I was here, and I can count on it still being here. I, I didn't need to think about it in the intervening three months since I've been in Baltimore and so forth. Or if it were three years, it would, it would still be there. Our memories don't work that way. So we don't have one trial memory, for example, in general. Yes, question. The phone would not remember it. Well, I have this lucky silicone. No, yes, you're right. My silicone case would not. Would not uh, there are operating conditions. It's true. And we have some advantages on that. Um, I think we could take the phone to a higher temperature than you could take me. Um, and if we leave the air conditioned room, if this is the Baltimore of my childhood, we could probably test that. OK. Um, so our memory works in very different ways. I don't want to say straight out that one's better than the other. I think they each have as advantages. But our memories are organized in very different ways. I think there are ways of taking the advantages of both and putting them together, maybe for another day. But our memory winds up being, for example, very sensitive to frequency. So I have a better chance of remembering a phone number that I've heard many times than one that I've heard a single time. Um, our memories are very sensitive to similarity. And a particular characteristic that I want to focus on, one of the operating characteristics of our memory is it's highly sensitive to interference. So um, the things that are hard for us to remember are the things where there are 20 different things that would respond in your memory to the same cue. Um, so for example, what did you have for breakfast yesterday? For many people, you know, it's not very long ago, but for many people, that's a hard question to answer. And the reason is you've had a lot of breakfasts and there have been a lot of yesterdays. And so you ask your brain, what did I have for breakfast yesterday? You get many responses and the brain gets confused between the two. Um, this explains, for example, why pilots have to use checklists. A pilot has to use a checklist because remembering whether they pulled up their landing gear today is a difficult thing because if you remember, I mean, if, if you're a pilot, you fly many times. Each time that you fly, you have to pull up your landing gear. Each time that you fly, you put down a memory trace of that. That memory trace stays. And on the particular occasion when you're flying now, you may get confused that I pull it up now or before. So use a checklist to mark it off. Um, my favorite um, morbid statistic of late is about skydivers who can't use checklists because they're too busy. First time skydivers don't have any problem remembering to pull the ripcord because there's no interference. <laughs> right? I, I don't need, almost don't need to finish it, do I? But <laughs> the number, the percentage of all skydiving fatalities that is due to people that forgot to pull the ripcord, which I submit is a property of having the kind of memory that is organized by context rather than location, is 6%. 6% of all people that die in skydiving accidents simply forgot to pull the ripcord. And yeah, I know you want to know how we know that. We calculate that by looking at um, subtracting the number of equipment failures and, and, and things like that. Some people don't put on the parachute at all. That's another story. <laughs> I'm going to guess that those people had something different in mind from the people who simply, OK. Um, so we have the sort of memory that can be fairly unreliable. Um, now, why am I telling you all this? Well, because 
I wish that we had this kind of memory whenever I try to parse these kinds of sentences with my meager brain. Um, in, if, if what you can store is basically tables in your safe deposit boxes, which is the most trivial thing in the world for a computer to do, well, you can map every syntactic tree onto a particular table. And then you're off to the races. There are lots of algorithms that will let you do things like find whatever is the mother node or find the sister of this particular node and so forth. And linguistic theory, um, especially in syntax, largely assumes that we can do these kinds of computations, like immediately calculate, does something, something dominate the node for the or dog? And, you know, can I trace the tree out to figure out what is C commanding? What is in this geometric relation to the stuff that's proceeding? Well, a computer can easily represent these kinds of things. You have a simple algorithm. You number the elements, um, one, two, three, four, and so forth. And then you say, you know, first element in the tree is, is the S node. Its daughters are two and three, and so forth. Um, a weak battery is no match for a yardstick, but you probably don't really need this. But anyway, so you just number all the items, and soon you've got your table, and everything works great. Um, and so as I'm sure everybody in this room knows every computer in the world or nearly every computer in the world, some smart person can come up with a counterexample, makes very, very heavy use of this kind of representation, right? All your directory structures, your folder structures, and so forth, there are all these hierarchical trees. Wonderful. On the other hand, let's reflect for a minute. Are people good at, at I mean, so like, let's take option number one. How are you going to represent a tree in a brain? Um, well, option number one would be you transform them into tables. But when you think about it, we're terrible at learning tables, right? I mean, a times table takes your average child somewhere between like a month and a year to learn, or at least a week, right, in order to learn a times table. It's not like you can upload a table into a human brain and expect somebody to remember it. I keep waiting for some smart ass to say, well, I remember my times table in a day, and then I'm going to ask them you know, to give me the cosine table or something like that. We're, we just don't have the kind of brain um, that allows us to easily remember tables. So that's sort of option number one. We can rule that out. Um, another option is the tensor calculus that Paul Smolensky, who's a few buildings over, um, um, proposed as a, as a way of representing trees. But that one doesn't work out very well either, because as your trees get bigger, um, there's an exponential increase in the number of nodes that you use. So that's not um, particularly biologically plausible. It turns out there is no good account in the literature of how a brain would actually represent a syntactic tree. Um, and I include in, in the examples of failed attempts something that I wrote in a 2001 book called The Algebraic Mind. I don't think that what I wrote works any better than Smolensky's, for example, that I just made fun of. Um, so here's the radical claim. If he can't do table lookup in the way that a computer can do, it might be really hard to represent trees. And worse, if all you've got available for memory is content addressable memory, you might really have to kludge together your representations of syntax. Um, I am. Um, and so other models of working memory? I think that, that all of the memory that we have, and I can't easily prove this, but I mean, we, we can you know, look for counterexamples. I'm, I'm suggesting that all, um, it's interesting and disappointing. Um, oh, maybe not. Um, all, all um, let me take a step back. So I think that there are multiple systems of memory in the human brain but that they are all derived from the same ancestral state of context-dependent memory, um, that they all have those properties. So procedural memory has that, declarative memory has that, and so forth. Um, that's the first part of my answer. The second part of my answer is if you have location-addressable memory, you can emulate context-addressable memory. And that's basically what search engines do. Um, I don't know how to formally prove this, but it's a whole lot more difficult to go the other way around. Um, you can kind of kludge together an approximation to the location addressability if you've got content addressability. Um, but it's much easier to start with the location addressable, um, build the content addressable on top. That's what I think Google does, and I think that's why Google has a much better memory system than I do. Um, I think that all of the things that we have for memory derive from an ancestral mechanisms that were basically content addressable. The only thing that I can think of as an exception is I think that we have a kind of single place working memory buffer. There's an argument that maybe it could hold four or something like that. Lisa and Justin have done some interesting work on this. Um, but there, there's some kind of direct addressability for a very small amount of stuff that's in working memory. The way I think of it is like on a CPU, there might be an immediate set of registers that are there. Everything else, I think, off that basic chip, if you will, um, I think is content addressable. And if you have counterexamples, I'd love to hear them. But that's the, that's the position that I'm arguing for. You want to ask another question? Okay, um, so you see this scene. You think that you perceive the scene as a whole, 
but there's actually something that changes from one frame to the next. Um, and most people don't see it. What is the thing that changes? I, I'll show you one more time. Um, whoops. What changed? There were a couple of frames there. The engine, probably because it was so poorly displayed, it didn't work as well as it usually does. Typically, when I um, give this demonstration, it takes about like half the room takes several minutes to actually get it. Um, I don't know what and Justin might know the exact empirical data in laboratory conditions, but people find it difficult typically to notice that the engine has has appeared and disappeared. They're all focused on. Um, I, I, they are all focused on um, the soldiers and so forth, and they don't even notice that there's an engine coming and going. So the, the take-home message is you can have the intuitive perception that you see the world as a whole, but maybe you don't actually see the world as a whole. Maybe afterwards I'll try to show you the, the video separately. Um, I'm trying to argue that our representation of language is, is similar, that you, you believe it to be sort of unified in a way that maybe it isn't really. So um, in collaboration with Matt Wagers, who's a, a graduate student at the University of Maryland, about to postdoc at NYU and then work, um, take a faculty job at Santa Cruz, um, I've been developing an idea that I call a treelet um, representation of language. It relates to something in the linguistic literature called treelets, but it's a bit more radical um, than, than what's already been proposed. But basically the idea is that rather than representing this, a unified tree in the way that any computer parser uh, that made any sense would work, what we have is lots of bits of structure that are not necessarily unified, or they're unified in very transitory ways um, using things like working memory. We don't have a full tree, and so we can't do tree geometric computations where we say, well, what is the first um, branching node above this node, for example? So I think it's easier to illustrate this idea with a static, I mean, sorry, with a slightly dynamic representation rather than a static one. So imagine you're parsing a sentence and you hear a word. Well, what do you do? You hypothesize that there's some kind of grammatical structure that, that is um, not audible, but that is behind, was there a question in the back? Or just, no. Um, um, there's some part of grammatical structure that you haven't heard that you have to infer. So you hear the word it. You guess that maybe that's part of a noun phrase. That noun phrase is part of a sentence, and, and maybe there's going to be a sister um, verb phrase note and so forth. Everybody kind of comfortable with those types of notions. So then um, you hear another word like was, and you guess maybe it's part of a verb phrase, and you just go along. And on this view, what you're doing is you're building up in context-dependent memory a set of partial representations that I'm calling treelets. Um, but you're not really sure how they go together. And as things go along, first everything seems fine, but if you have a sentence like, it was the dancer, and then you get to the fireman, you're no longer sure of the bindings. Now what you would like to do, ideally, is to be able to retrace in your mind's eye what came first as you get more structure so that you could integrate it all together. But what I'd like to suggest is we, if we don't actually have location addressable memory, it might be pretty hard to build a system that gives us veridical, reliable access to the stuff that's come before and how it's come before and that you should get interference effects. So if the dancer and the fireman are two noun phrases, they're both animate, um, and they've both occurred recently, you might well confuse them together. So when you get to the point where you have enough information to maybe resolve the um, sentence, it was the dancer the fireman liked, you're really deeply confused. You have all these little pieces in your context-dependent memory, and you're not sure how they go together. And in fact, to parse this particular sentence, you would have to hypothesize more structure that you haven't heard. Um, no problem with that. But as you continue to do that, your access to the previous parts should get worse and worse. Um, and sure enough, people have a lot of trouble parsing sentences like these. I'm going to give you five examples in a moment. Um, but the notion is you've got transitory bindings, you have a bunch of fragments of trees, treelets, stored in context-dependent memory. And context-dependent memory is subject to these interference effects, where if there are cues that retrieve multiple cases, you don't really know which element you're looking for. So let me give um, several reasons why I think this is the kind of linguistic theory that one ought to look for. Um, the first is a simple fact that you can find in any intro psych textbook, but you don't often find in linguistics textbooks. It's not something that has played an important role in linguistic theorizing, but I think it actually should. And it's a simple fact that people can remember gist fairly well, but they're not actually that good at remembering verbatim syntactic structure. Well, on some linguistic theories, you actually need the entire structure in order to do the parsing. So um, if you think, for example, of the principles and parameters theory that was popular at MIT in, in the 80s and 90s, the idea was you had these principles that you computed over the entire sentence structure, 
um, in order to decide whether the sentence was grammatical. But if you can't actually represent the whole sentence structure, if you can't even remember it, how are you representing it? Um, that's, I think, a bit of a problem for those kinds of theories. Um, and that sentence was not grammatical for anyone keeping track. Um, it also turns out that even when people do get the verbatim syntactic structure right, usually what they're really doing is reconstructing. So they're subject to all these different priming manipulations and so forth. So if you did an experiment, you might say in this experiment, you know, 60% of the time people are reconstructing it accurately, but that um, they would be getting it right for the wrong reasons is basically the take home message from the literature. Um, it's that they would be guessing what you might have said, reconstructing from the gist um, what might have gone on. Okay, second example. Um, is vulnerability to um, interference. So I took that previous example from um, a simplified version from an actual study where you had sentences like, it was the dancer that liked the fireman before um, the argument began. Now on the classic theory of syntactic representation, like a very strong so-called modularity theory where language would be separate from the rest of the cognitive system, you might imagine that there would be tree structures for language. They would be separate memory structures than we use in other domains. And if I gave you a sentence like this, after earlier asking you to remember a list of words, these words shouldn't be candidates um, for basically you have to, in this sentence, let me start that sentence over again. Um, in this sentence, you have to figure out what the subject is in order to actually understand. So is the dancer that, and then in sort of many linguistic theories, you would say there's an empty category there. It was the dancer that somebody liked um, the fireman before the argument began. So part of what you need to do in order to parse the sentence, you have to reconstruct what the subject of liked is. So you should have candidates, and those candidates, according to classic linguistic theory, should be given to you by the tree geometric structure of the sentence. Things that are in the appropriate parts of the um, syntactic tree should be reasonable candidates. Nothing else should. So things that are not in appropriate places, however geometrically defined, shouldn't um, be candidates uh, for reconstructing who did what to whom, basically. But the reality is if I make you memorize a list of words first, like banker, lawyer, police officer, they're not on the tree, right? I said memorize these words and now we're going to do some other sentences. They're not on the tree, but people still suffer when they parse these sentences based on this other stuff that's floating around in memory. So the weakest thing that I think that shows is that the strongest versions of the modularity theory aren't right. The strongest versions of the modularity theory that would say, you've got a module in your head, what it does is process language and it's shaped to the adaptive needs of language, just doesn't predict that some other stuff that's laying about in working memory and isn't on the syntactic tree should have an effect. But the reality is that it does. And it does in exactly the kind of way that context-dependent memory always does. So if you change this from banker, lawyer, and police officer to Joe, Mary, and Susan, um, then people don't have as much trouble because those things aren't as similar. So the degree of similarity, um, I'll take your question in a second, predicts the um, level of accuracy, or I guess it's inversely correlated with the, the level of accuracy. So this is, I think, very nice evidence from a bunch of different labs. I'm sorry I don't have names up here. Um, Peter Gordon from North Carolina started doing these studies about five years ago. Now there's also studies from Brian McElry, um, Rick Lewis, Julie Van Dyke, and some others. Question? Yeah, so is it also true if you have to remember images? Um, or sounds because these are words, you know, so there might be just, you know, uses in machine learning. I mean, I would predict, I, I don't think the data exists for that particular manipulation yet. My prediction would be that the more that you could show, say, in independent Raider judgments about similarity, that there's overlap, the more that you would have, have problems. Um, but I don't know, I don't know the answer for sure. Um, just one more example of this interference kind of stuff is a famous set of um, kinds of sentences called center embedded clauses, which probably many of you have heard about, that are notoriously difficult. And I like this study because it was done with MIT undergraduates. And thinking about the competence and performance thing, people might say that, well, these memory interference things are a problem when you lack sufficient computational performance. So I've taken this study from the undergraduates that allege themselves to have the highest um, memory capacities and highest cognitive performance. Um, in the land, MIT undergraduates. I know that they believe this because I was a graduate student there and I TA'd them and I know they all thought that they had the greatest computational capacities. So in, in this study done by Ted Gibson at MIT, people had to read these sentences and, and do grammaticality judgments on them. Does this sound okay? Does it not sound okay? They weren't paired together. There were lots of filler items and so forth. The question is, um, you know, can the students tell which one of these is more plausibly grammatical than the other? These people with high memory capacities and big brain power and all of that kind of stuff, you know, 800 SAT math and, and, and 800 SAT verbal, and, and you give them these sentences, and they're at chance. Now, any machine parser 
would have no trouble whatsoever at discriminating them because here you can draw a tree structure and here you can't. There's something missing here. So um, I didn't read these for you, but the one at the top, the ancient manuscript that the graduate student who the new card catalog had confused a great deal was missing a page, happens to be missing an entire clause. There are three subjects and two predicates. The pieces do not align. You could make an argument that it's hard to figure out what this guy means, the one on the bottom, but at least it could be a well-formed tree. The one at the top couldn't be a well-formed tree. And having an MIT, you know, being qualified to be an MIT undergraduate doesn't give you enough power to do it. Why? Because this particular type of sentence loads very heavily on the kind of stuff you would want from location addressable memory and have to kludge together with content addressable memory. What you want to know is you get along to confused a great deal and you want to know which of these things is the plausible subject. You would like, ideally, to have a tree that you could go back and see geometrically what is constrained as a possible subject here and so forth. But what you really have is something that's a lot vaguer. It's an approximation. It's well, there were some animate things before, but wait, I guess you don't really need to be animate to confuse something. A book could confuse something. I don't know. And your brain sort of, um, to use the technical term, explodes, right? I mean, your brain goes along and, and you can't remember which of these is which. Uh, this can happen even in very short sentences, by the way. My favorite one is people, people, left, left. Four words, and it's still hard enough to induce this problem you get with interference. People, people, left, left. What does it mean? It's people that people left, left. If I sort of draw the structure and exaggerate the prosody, you can start to understand it. And ideally, I put in some complementizers there. People that people left left. Uh, wait, so even in a sort of you know four-word sentence, so it's not like raw sentence length. There's a particular kind of sentence that's really hard for us, and it's the kind where tracing the relations. In order to do it properly, you would want the geometry, and instead, all you've got is this kludged approximation. Example number three, this is from Fernanda Ferreira. Sentences like, while Anne addressed, the baby slept. These are garden path sentences. They're designed to trick you so that you'll initially parse it incorrectly, and that's fine, so that people parse it incorrectly. They initially go along, while Anne addressed the baby. They think you know, it's going to continue on. While Anne addressed the baby, the television blared loudly or something like that. They think it's, I guess you'd call it in the positive. Um, but then they get to the word slept, and they realize, um, some of them, some proportion of subjects realize um, that the word slept doesn't quite fit together with the rest of the structure that they have. And so they have to revise, and they do. And you ask them afterwards, you say, what did the baby do? And they say, oh, the baby slept. So they, they act as if they parsed the sentence. But then you say, um, who dressed the baby? Or sorry, what you say? What um, who, who did Anna address? And they say the baby, right? If you would really parse the sentence, you'd realize that it was Anna addressed herself while Anna was dressing. The baby slept, but people don't realize that. And what they wind up with is actually an inconsistent set of partial parses. So on the one hand, on their mental blackboard. Um, They've written down the baby slept, or you know, some semantic ease interpretation of that. On the other hand, they still have lingering up there on the blackboard, and address the baby, and they can't get rid of it. So another thing I forgot to stress is computer memory. If you know where the locations are, you can replace their contents. But if you don't know where they are, you may be stuck in this position where you just accumulate memories. And the reason that you can't remember, um, I, another example I didn't give you, the reason you can't remember where you parked your car for example, is because you remember where you parked your car last week and two weeks before and three weeks. It's all still there even though you don't need to know anymore where you parked your car two weeks ago. It's all still there. And we don't have an erase operation. We just have this accumulate and hope that you get through to the right one kind of thing. And when, when you're stuck with that, you can easily have this problem of lingering inferences. You, you write something down on your mental blackboard, it doesn't go away and you might get stymied by it. Okay. Um, yet another example of something that simply would not happen if what you had is, is well-formed trees and nothing more. Um, here was my one production example, is that um, you, you had asked earlier, the keys to the cabinet. What is the grammatical continuation? Everybody should know the rule, which is that the main, um, the main subject has to agree with the main verb. But if you throw in an intervening clause and you wind up with the keys to the cabinet, so to the cabinet is, is this intervening clause, people are really kind of unsure about it. Does it go is or are? And, I mean, there's actually a whole field of people, um, a profession of people who spend like 80% of their effort, I think, trying to find cases like this. this is, I'm speaking, of course, of copy editors, right? Copy editors are like there to find agreement errors. And I'm sure if you look at you know, any book done by any reputable copy editor, you will still find some of these things. They slip through. We're really not very good at detecting them. Um, it's a pervasive kind of error. Well, why is that? Again, if you had the tree, 
you shouldn't make these errors because it's obvious if you have the tree what the main subject is and what the main verb is. There's no reason to predict that people would have any particular problem executing the rule. But if what you imagine is instead of having a tree, you have fragments and pieces, then you might get confused which fragment or which piece am I applying this agreement rule to. Last example. Um, I think I'm a little bit behind you. The last example uh, of this sort of thing um, is local confusion. So you can have a sentence like, the coach smiled at the player tossed a frisbee. And people get stuck because the words player tossed a frisbee is a locally well-formed unit, even though globally it shouldn't fit into the proper parse. If you were really sort of doing things incrementally and you had the overall structure, you shouldn't care, but people do. Another example that I don't have um, experimental data on, but I think makes the point more clearly, is the one at the bottom. More people have been to Russia than I have. Sounds like a grammatical sentence. If you stuck it in a um, grammaticality judgment task, people would say that it's perfectly fine. They would think it's an example of ellipsis. Um, but only the people who are giggling, perhaps, have realized that this is not a possible sentence. Right? You thin out the ellipsis and you get, more people have been to Russia than I have been to Russia. And it makes no sense whatsoever. Right? Um, so this is a case of things that are locally well formed. All the fragments are fine. It's globally, well, globally ill-formed, but you don't necessarily notice. Which, of course, should remind you of vision, right? That, you, that one, by the way, was apparently a production example uh, from Robin Park. Um, I mean, they're attributed to Montebetti, um, a linguist um, at MIT in the 80s, but there's, there's a dispute about it. And if Clark wants to take credit for it, then, then if, he, if he'll take credit for it in an email, I'll be happy to give him continuing credit forthwith. I mean, it doesn't matter how it came to be. The fact is that, that people do have trouble noticing its, its ill-formedness. And I think it's like these Escher cases. You know, I actually went to a talk yesterday by um, a former grad student at NYU who's working on possible and impossible objects. And she says she got into the field when she saw an Escher um, etching um, that she thought was well-formed. She was like, wow, I didn't know Escher did any um, you know, well-formed things. And then she looked at it more carefully, and she realized that it wasn't, in fact, well-formed, that there were arches crossing over one another and so forth. And that's when she decided that she was going to study stuff like this for a living. She studies how babies come to understand them. Um, but the point is, you get the same kind of phenomena where if it's locally well-formed, you may not notice that it's globally ill-formed. Again, that fits with partial representation. OK, so to recap so far, um, I've given you five otherwise puzzling phenomena that I don't think follow at all from virtual conceptual necessity. I guess that's the next bullet point on the slide. So if you were building a parser from scratch, from first principles, you would presumably have tree structures. You would be ludicrous not to have tree structures. But if you included proper trees in the way that you know, any computer science 101 class will teach you how to do, you wouldn't have to have a problem with verbatim syntactic structure, with vulnerability to interference, with local confusion, and so forth. So I put it to you that these facts about the parser emerge not from any logical consideration about how to build parsers, but from history, from an accident of history, which is that the kind of memory that was off the shelf, I guess that's not on the slide, the kind of memory that's off the shelf for biological creatures is this content-driven stuff. And evolution doesn't have enough foresight to say, hey, if I'm going to build this whole new component, this language component that no other creature has, what subcomponents might I need to build that I don't already have in my, my library of stuff? Evolution doesn't have that foresight, and so it just used the same old memory system, which might be fine for deciding whether there's more food up the mountain than down the mountain, but might not be good for the kind of precision recall that you need um, in building a parser and going up and down a tree. All right. So I think this is a very nice example um, towards the evolutionary arguments of how evolutionary inertia actually plays out in the structure of the mind. I think it's a serious challenge to the notion of, of the parser being just something you could simply predict from, from optimal constraints. The money question, if you're a linguist, of course, is could evolution have shaped competence? So many linguists see this talk and their first impression is, OK, but that's all just about performance. It's about processing. Does the grammar itself show any traces of hallmarks of evolution? I don't have a knockdown argument, but I have some candidates. Um, my favorite candidate is ambiguity, which I alluded to earlier briefly. Um, if you were building a language from scratch, would you include um, the possibility that people would inadvertently speak a ambiguous sentences? Probably not. I mean, you might include the possibility that people would deliberately use ambiguity. You might include mechanisms for vagueness where you don't have a lot of detail and so forth. But ambiguity is pretty easily avoided, but it's pervasive in language. So 
sorry, easily avoided in principle, but it's pervasive in language. So we have sentences like the spy shot the cop um, with the revolver. And I assume most of you in this room are very familiar with these sorts of things, right? It could be that the cop had the revolver. It could be that the spy had the revolver. People tend to assume that it was the spy. He had his choice. He could use the, the rifle or, or the submachine gun that was licensed as a hunting device. Um, he chose to use the revolver because he thought there'd be more sport in it. Um, or it could be um, that the, there was actually two cops. There was a cop with a revolver and there was a cop um, with, with a nightstick and he thought, you know, I better get rid of the one with a revolver first. I'll move on to Mr. Nightstick later. Um, so the sentence is ambiguous. There are lots of such ambiguities in language. People aren't particularly aware of them. So there's some nice work by Boaz Kazar um, where he does social psychology studies where he doesn't lie to people. And if you know social psychology, you know that's unusual because usually psychologists bring you in under pretext. Like um, my former colleague John Barge brought people into the lab. He said, I want you to unscramble the words in this sentence. Um, and secretly, half the words in the sentence had to do with things like Florida and, and old people and stuff like that. And then, then he would measure how long it took them to walk to the elevator. He wasn't interested in, in the unscrambling. <laughs> he was interested in how long it took them to walk to the elevator. The answer, by the way, is they walk more slowly if they read lots of words about Florida and the elderly. Um, but they didn't know that. So Kazar does this study where he says, this is what an ambiguous sentence is. And he walks you through basically what I just walked you through. He says, I want you to read some of these aloud. And all I want to know is, can you get the other, whoops, can you get the other guy um, to understand the sentence? So I want you to read, put the cup on the towel on the table and stuff like that, and tell me, does the other guy understand? And you can use prosody to make yourself clear, and, and you can gesticulate. I can't remember if you allowed, allowed people to gesticulate. But um, he, he said they could use as much um, variation in the intonation um, as they like. People were terrible at this task. They, they fell into what's known as the curse of knowledge. They assumed, if I know it, you know it. Um, and they, this would happen in both directions. So the speakers overestimated how often they were understood. They could, they could check a box saying, I don't think the guy got it. But they would check the box thinking, I think the guy got it when he didn't. And then the listeners did the same thing. They thought they understood a lot more um, than they actually did. So ambiguity is a real problem, even though we're mostly not aware of it. Um, yet there's no principled reason why a language um, should be this way. I mean, there's a really simple solution. Um, to the problem of, of inadvertent ambiguity, which is parentheses, right? Every Lisp programmer, I guess there's some programmers in here, knows this thing very well. Um, right? All you have to do is put parentheses, and you can make clear the bracketing. And that's what all these particular ambiguities are about. They're basically problems in bracketings not being clear. So you could, in principle, mark this stuff very clearly. Question? Uh, yes, it, isn't that ambiguity kind of a natural result of an overcomplete representation? And aren't there good reasons for having an overcomplete representation? I guess I don't actually know how you're using the word overcomplete. I could guess, but I'm not sure how. Um, just in the sense that there, there's more ways to say uh, what you want to say. There's not just one. I mean, I would argue that that shows that the representation is underspecified in, rather than overcomplete. But I, I'm not comfortable with the term. But I would say that, that I mean, you have a, to start with, you have a kind of many-to-one mapping um, where many thoughts can get expressed in the single sentence. But mathematicians is effectively um, are confronted with the same thing, and they solve that problem by using parentheses. So they realize that when you denote a complex hierarchical equation in a serial medium, if you don't use parentheses, you will be stuck with this many to one. And if there's one thing mathematicians know, it's that you know the way to truth and beauty is in one-to-one -one mappings, right? You want um, to one-to-one -one map between your, your equation and, and your formalism on a page. So mathematicians say, let me find a way to do that. I know, parentheses. I mean, you can use you know, space on the page, too, in different ways. But so there's a very easy way to enforce that, that ultimately you have this one-to-one -one mapping. And l what I'm saying is, isn't it kind of, I mean, this is almost the Jerry Seinfeld part of my show. I'm saying, did you ever notice that language didn't bother to do this? You know, why is that? Right? I mean, it didn't, it didn't have to be that way. Um, OK. So what I would suggest is that language actually relies on a um, kludgy solution. Most of the time, we don't recognize ambiguity because language as a whole, as opposed to sort of syntax, which is really what I've been focusing on, which I've been clear about, um, language as a whole has a lot of mechanisms by which we can get around the fact that we don't have the parentheses, that we don't have a simple solution to making the bracket, bracketing as explicit as we would like. For example, we can use intonation. We can point at things. We can guess that you'll know what I mean because there is only one table or one towel and, and so forth. So 
We use some theory of mind, guessing what you might mean. We put a whole lot of things together. It works reasonably well. It doesn't work perfectly. Sometimes people misunderstand each other. Another morbid statistic I have in new, my new book is about a plain, well, it's just, I don't know if it counts as a statistic, morbid um, factoid is that um, there was a plane crash in which ambiguity led to 600 people dying because mission control and, and um, the plane had different ideas about what at takeoff might mean. Um, basically, it was a kind of bracketing problem. So um, these kinds of things can have consequences. Most of the time, we avoid them because we have a lot of different mechanisms for dealing with it. But why, why don't we, in the first place, have a language that has parentheses or something like that? Well, it turns out one person actually tried to create such a language, maybe more than one. Um, this comes from a wonderful and underknown paper um, by James Cook Brown that was published in the Scientific American in 1960. I think it kind of got lost in history because it was part of linguistics and linguistics was you know, at a very fertile time when people were thinking in other directions. But what he wanted to do was to create a logically perfect language that would not have, for example, inadvertent ambiguity. This is a joke that's three levels of geekiness deep, so you're forgiven if you don't find it funny. But for those who share my level of geekiness, um, this is translated into the log. This is the only known cartoon in the Logland language. Um, and um, I have explained to you what the Worf hypothesis is, and this is tran it's translated at the bottom. Professor Brown, someone who is here who wants proof of the Worf hypothesis. So this, this cartoon captures this man's entire research effort. Um, May we all be so lucky. Um, alas, nobody was ever actually able to learn Logland. So um, you, you can read the website. There's a website about Logland. And there are these sentences. And they're just sort of embarrassing. They, they say things like, after you know, years of practice, we were able to hold 45-minute telephone conversations. And I mean, nobody's done the right experiment. Nobody has taught Logland to an infant, which um, I'm sure at least Justin and Lisa and I would, would love um, to do. Um, perhaps they would like to volunteer their infant. I'll, I'll, be, getting, I'll be sending you books on tape. Um, it, notwithstanding their, their delight in participating in this experiment, um, so nobody has actually done the right experiment. But with adults, anyway, people have found this language really, really hard to learn. And I would suggest that's because it, it's like putting a square peg in a round hole. What the language needed to do in order to be perfect was to add a whole bunch of little words that basically acted like parentheses that kept track of your levels of embedding and stuff like that. And if you don't have location addressable memory, you can't remember that stuff. The, the bitter reality is that Lisp programmers understand what parentheses are, but they can't keep track of them either, right? Lisp programmers have all built themselves little functions. You press the right parentheses, and the left one that matches it flashes. Because you can't remember, and you wrote the program, right? <laughs> now I found, found my audience, yes. So, OK. <laughs> So the fact that we don't use something simple and powerful like parentheses is because we don't have the kind of brain that can really deal with that level of detail. Um, I mean, we can deal with some kinds of detail, but we don't have the kind of memory that would support keeping track of where the parentheses are in the first place. So I would suggest um, that that's a case where the competence of language has actually been shaped in response to the bitter realities of the memory representations that we can use underlying language. Um, there are some more technical corners of linguistics. You, you guys are not you know, doctrinaire, MIT, um, uh, linguist, linguistic graduate students. who Some of this stuff may not appeal to you. But um, the, the general notion in a lot of linguistics is, in, in syntax, is there are these things called locality constraints. So like, you can only move something if you believe in transformations or different notations and different syntactic theories. But you can only move something or connect something so far in the tree or this is the way that they're typically spelled out, um, that are, again, from the point of view of virtual conceptual necessity, entirely gratuitous. Or so these rules people struggle, like, why is it that you can extract from a subject position but not an object position? And people try to tell stories about the distance on a tree and how many intervening nodes you've crossed and all this kind of stuff. But they all boil down, ultimately, to what people call locality constraints. I would suggest that they only complicate the language. I, there is a counter argument here to be made about language acquisition we could talk about. But I would suggest that it's gratuitous. And the only reason, again, is not from first principles about how you would build your language. It's from the fact that we basically work with local fragments of representation. Because we don't quite have the, brown, the brain wherewithal. There was a kludge, a speech error. We don't quite have the brain wherewithal to support the representation of an entire syntactic tree such that you would be able to do um, the arbitrary connections. And instead, the more stuff that intervenes, roughly speaking, the more likely you are to get confused. And so you wind up with these locality things.
All right, where does all of this leave linguistics? How are we on discussion time? These are sort of like discussion-y slides you could just ask me anyway, and I don't want to go over. Should I keep going? Do you want to just ask me questions now? Like, where does this lead linguistics and symbol manipulation? And we can just come back to the slides, or I can just tell you now. OK, so where does this leave linguistics then? Um, one thing is I think that rumors of true recursion may be exaggerated. So there's a very influential p paper about the evolution of language that appeared in Science a couple years ago, um, five, six years ago at this point, by Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch that says that the one thing about human language that might be special relative to animal languages is that we have a process of recursion. Um, if what I say is right, then that's an odd way, at least, of framing the difference. Because essentially, I'm suggesting that we don't quite have true recursion, or at least that as a representational system, as opposed to a computational algorithmic thing, we're not very good at representing it. And it turns out that people have started to actually look at the data. So there is, there is um, a idealization in the literature, which is that people can handle full recursion. But if you actually look at what people do, they don't do a lot of full recursion. So for example, Fred Carlson, um, who's in Helsinki, who we just saw a few weeks ago, has a paper um, about center embedding. It says basically it's absent in speech. So people can do it. He tries to argue that it's something that you find in writing, and it's a sort of formal thing. And so in the way that like, you can argue that the brain can do calculus in the abstract, but people don't know how to do it formally unless they take lessons, people can kind of well, it's not a perfect analogy here, but people can kind of articulate the rules of recursion, but they may not be able to compute them unless they've you know, taken computer science courses and things like that. And maybe they don't really use such things in, in their linguistic structure. Um, second point is that pure ge tree geometric accounts of linguistics, which are, or of syntax, I'll say, which are most of them, um, may be expecting too much of the parser. So for example, a common thing when I was in graduate school was people tried to explain distributions of facts like this. You can say John likes himself and himself refers to John, but you can't say John likes him and have him refer back to John. So um, I've, it's a little bit too long ago. I think one of those is licensed by principle A and the other is, is a violation of principle B according to the theory that was popular in the 80s. Uh, and the idea is that you could determine that tree geometrically. So you could say um, the reason that him can't be co-indexed with John is it's essentially it's too close in the geometry of the tree. It's C commanded by the antecedent, so it's out. The problem is those kinds of theories never really quite work. They got a lot of the data, but there were always problems. There were problems like um, uh, Steve Pinker's famous favorite counterexample was from a ba basketball player. Pinker's a big basketball fan. And it was Bill Lambeer who said, um, I'm so bad, sometimes even I don't like me. And technically, that me could not refer back to that I because it's in a C commanded position and so forth. But the pragmatics make it absolutely clear that Lambeer is referring um, to himself. And then there were all these cases like John likes pictures of himself. So you put in the word picture, and suddenly that seemed to override the other structural facts. And eventually, people started backing down to things like, well, this was D-linked, or there's some kind of discourse representation, and so forth. My view of this, and um, syntacticians may argue with me, someone probably would agree with me, is that the effort to explain all of this in purely tree geometric terms simply failed. People tried, and it didn't work. And I'm giving you a principled reason why maybe going down that direction in the first place might not have been the best idea. Um, the last point on, on this slide is that language may be recursive in principle, but actual human beings are forced to muddle through without a convenient way of representing trees. So if you, at least if you really want to understand the parser and understand some of the wacky things that people do and where they get stuck and so forth, I think that you have to realize they don't actually have a tree. And they're trying to make do with this. They're trying to kludge by um, with this rather lesser uh, representational system. Another question this raises is where does this leave symbol manipulation? So anybody who knows Lisp basically knows the premises of symbol manipulation. And I wrote a book in 2001 that basically said the brain was something like a Lisp machine. I didn't quite spell it out because I figured that most of my audience wasn't computer programmers. But I made seven claims about the mind. The first was that the mind had a neurally realized way of representing symbols, which already turns out, mind you, to be controversial in the cognitive sciences. Um, there are some people, especially working on neural networks, who would argue that this is not true. Um, and then I went further out on, on the tree, further out on the limb, and I said that we had a neurally realized way of representing variables. So I mean, obviously, again, if you're a programmer, you know, variables are your stock in trade, but it's controversial in, in cognitive science. And then I said operations over variables. So the title of the book, The Algebraic Mind, came from this notion that even infants, and I had some empirical data that were relevant to this, even infants could do kind of the abstract kinds of representation or computation you'd expect of, of 
basic algebra one, where you say y equals x plus two, x is a is a substitute, uh, sorry, a placeholder. You substitute something into that, and you calculate a corresponding value. So you know y equals x plus two. I tell you x is seven. You calculate that y is nine. Um, I tried to argue that kids could recognize certain kinds of algebraic structures, and that this was a property of the mind. I argued this is not straight out of list by guess, but comes close. Um, that you'd have to have a type token distinction. So you have to be able to say this cup of water as opposed to cups in general. And it turns out that the connectionist models that were popular at the time couldn't really do that. And then I said you have to have a way of representing ordered pairs. So um, A B versus B A. You have to be able to represent that man bites dog is not the same thing as dog bites man. Um, then I went on to say that we had a way of representing structured units that were a little bit bigger than an ordered pair. And then I went further. Um, to number seven, and one should never go up to seven, I think is the moral of this story. I said that we have ways of representing arbitrary trees, which would consist of having a perfect, reliable way of putting all those structured units together. I now think, what was I thinking? If we had that, why on earth wouldn't we be able to repeat sentences verbatim? So I now think that the proper account of symbol manipulation, I think all of the stuff above the line is actually true, but that I was simply wrong about the last one. The arguments weren't as, as good as I thought. I gave a proposed solution that depended on labeling each of these structured units with a particular unique identifier, and then you'd read, which is sort of like Lisp if you understand the underlying mechanics of Lisp. I think it turns out we just can't do that. And there's all kinds of empirical evidence, like the stuff that I just gave, that shows that people at least don't give any immediate apparent evidence of actually having a full tree. So that's where I think it leaves symbol manipulation. For those who know what connectionism is in neural networks, they're sort of at the top. They don't think we have any of this stuff. Um, in my early salad days, I was um, at the extreme at the bottom thinking we had the full kit. And now I'm saying we come close to that. We're way far from what the connectionists would assume. But we don't quite have the same representational um, apparatus as your average computer. Maybe other things would do better. OK. Um, more broadly, and this is the last slide, linguistics has never lacked for theories. So the thing that strikes a psychologist who strays into linguistics, and that's what I am, um, is what you'd like is to know the linguistic theory so you could go out and test it. Right? My day job, which I haven't really talked about today, is studying how kids acquire language. And what we would like to know is, what is the structure of language so we can test? What do kids know about it? What are, you know, what are the primitives of language? What are the, you know, the representational apparatus, the combinatorial apparatus, and so forth? So we can see, you know, is that innate? Does it come in later? Do kids need specific experience acquired? And what we, have, what we psychologists have all come to learn is that the linguists have no idea what the answer to this question is. You talk to seven linguists and you get seven answers. There's the aspects theory, the LFG theory, the HBSG theory, the GB theory, the minimalist theory, tag theory. This is not a complete list. There are many different theories they all have different ways of, of constructing what a grammar even is, let alone sort of some of the finer points. Um, my hope, and one of the reasons that I'm doing this kind of work, is that maybe looking at our ancestral history might give us one more piece of evidence that could help us choose between those theories. So if it's true that language is basically a product not just of demands on opt optimal function, but also on historical constraints, what were the pieces in place before language, then we have a new tool with which to choose between linguistic theories and therefore get back to the very thing that I started with, which is explanation in linguistics. Maybe languages, for example, prefer local constraints over global constraints because our memories could only support that and not something else. So I thank you very much. I'm, I'm here all afternoon. I'm happy to take questions now, or I think we can organize things after people. Uh, um, so there are problems with language. Uh, that's that's interesting. But I'm, I'm very relieved to see that vision is safe because we've had well, I'm being too kind of vision, but or, or a billion years. Of, but why were safer? We, why are we fooled by the Escher figures then? I mean, the truth is it's safer. It's not perfect. I mean, wh one of the things that, that vision does is, is it makes compromises. And we can talk about how much language does that. Um, one of the things that it does is compromises about, for example, lighting sources. So we, we have evolved, I presume, to think that the lighting comes from above. And we get confused if you know, an image is constructed as if the lighting came from the bottom and so forth. So be, I think it would be too much to ask, in fact, for the visual system to perfectly reconstruct from any two-dimensional stimulus what three-dimensional, I mean two-dimensional retinal representation, what three-dimensional representation is out there in the world. I think the visual system generally does that pretty well. There are things in the visual system that are pretty boneheaded stupid. Um, you, you may know some of the stuff I'm alluding to, but for example, there's a blind spot, right? So the retina is perfect at detecting light in a dark room, but it's, 
the, the mammalian vertebrate retina, as opposed to the invertebrate retina, is wired backwards, so we wind up with a blind spot. So I mean, I, I was exaggerating a bit to say that I think that it's perfect. I think, in general, that vision is better engineered, that it's harder to find um, the clumsy cases um, than it is in language. And I think in language, the lack of a tree structure is just like a really serious problem. I mean, it's not deadly because we can you know, find other, other ways of coping with it, but it's, it's like, why would you do that? It's, it's sort of on par, I guess, with the, you know, why, why wire it up backward, the retina backwards. I think in general, there's, there's sort of more rough edges to language, and it's on the whole a more um, clumsily constructed system. I guess this brings up an issue that, that's been bothering me throughout your talk, which is, and I, you know, it's not it's a contribution of a lot of researchers, but is this notion of optimality or the optimal solution to something. So, Like some optimal for what? Op exactly, optimal for what? And so you seem to, you know, sometimes take sort of a platonistic view of like, if we were to design a language that's for communication, how would we do it? And, mm -hmm. then, and then we can say, well, human language is not optimal from that perspective. But that's obviously crazy because we have evolved, obviously. And I mean, there's other things like, so you're saying about how um, syntax doesn't put parentheses, but then you go on, on, on to say that prosody is a parenthesis. Well, but porosity is a sort of poor, I mean, there's two parts to your question so far already, and so I'm going to interrupt and then you can come back. But so porosity is a poor solution, I think, um, to parentheses. It's, it's, it's a kludge in the sense that it, it's not guaranteed to get you to the right place. So, I mean, like in language acquisition, people explored the hypothesis that maybe kids use porosity to find out the boundaries between elements. And as you may well know, it turns out that correlations are good, but they're not, they're not ideal. And people pause for all kinds of other reasons and, and, and so forth. Um, so I think prosody is a clumsy solution, and that's the point there, is, is that you, know, you, can, you can come up with alternatives, but they're not as good. So I mean, MacGyver is maybe like the, the, the master kluger, and when he makes you know, shoes out of floor mats and duct tape, it's not that that's how you would build shoes if you had you know, a free moment. It's that it, it gets you through the night. It gets you to survive another day, and, and prosody is, is a is a further adaptation or invention or whatever that, that deals with it part way. Now going back to the first part, and then I'll let you ask a follow up. Um, I think that anybody that wants to argue for optimality has to say optimal for what. And what one really winds up with is a kind of proof by adversary kind of structure. So um, people can come to me and say, what I think language is optimal for is x. So you think it's optimal for the purpose of you know, clear and ambigu unambiguous communication, but I think language actually evolved to minimize the number of CPU cycles computed um, or whatever. And, and we just have to explore those things. So people make those proposals. My suggestion is that nobody's ever going to actually come up with an adequate story unless in, in the clause about what it's optimal for, they sneak in some evolutionary history. So it's really going to be optimal as a conjunction of some functions like the sort that maybe you were alluding to and the history stuff that I care about. So language is maybe it's optimized for communication given that you've got a system that's stuck with context-dependent memory and using um, its, its uh, um, you know, swallowing tube to produce the sound and, and so forth. Um, so I think that one can actually tell a story about what language is optimal for if one includes the evolutionary history. And then all we can do is somebody can say, but you know, it's actually this, and, and we can just explore it. Right, because something like prosody is something that maximizes like, parallel transmission. So in a, you know, it, it could be somehow easier than to actually put symbols in there you know, in, in a sentence structure if you can maximize when, 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 when somebody builds the lisp and you, you um, use a slider to indicate the color or something like that to um, have your brackettings, you know, then we'll do business. Well, but, but again, I mean, this is, I mean, but the other, the other aspect that I wanted to highlight also is just there's the notion, of, there's also the notion, which is touching on the confidence performance distinction, which is the optimality of the computation. Yeah. And that's, that gets tricky because I think there's a very muddy distinction now, the distinction that muddy, but, you know, certain, there's the term for the computation that mm -hmm. you're optimizing certain parameters, and that, that's different than necessarily having a, an evolved function that's optimal for some sort of I mean, I, so I mean that, that's certainly the way that, that some some linguists respond. Um, I don't really see how one could rationally reconstruct things like the locality conditions um, and so forth as being. I mean, Chomsky has tried to do this, but I, I don't see the argument that those things are actually optimal for computation. And I think, I mean, if language really were optimal for for computation, I think certainly we would have tree structures. We do all of this extra sort of sloppy computation that could be solved with precision. And so I just don't buy it. I mean, somebody can, I mean, 
people are always welcome to, to try to come up with clever accounts. And I mean, if you read the minimalist literature, a lot of it is trying to do exactly that. It's trying to say, well, you might think that it's bizarre that we have um, you know, locality constraints, but blah, 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 blah. I just don't, I, I don't see the argument there. But I see, I, be, I see the form of the argument, but I don't, I, I don't see convincing argument there. Um, further discussion at that point would probably, you know, we need paper and pencil, and, and we can talk later. Um, I think there's another sense of language optimality in that the, the use of language is optimal in communication. So if you think about that, then the force of evolution is actually on the use of language, but not the language itself. And uh, well, well, that depends. So how do you measure that? Well, there's a way. Actually, that has been worked on in Brown University by Denzel and Shanyak. They measured the, the information content of each sentence uh, in, the, in the entire discourse. And you always find a steady increase trend in the, uh, according with, the, with the increase of sentence number. So you, you say the least amount of stuff in the first sentence, and the gradually a little bit more in the second sentence, and the, so more and more, more and more in, in later discourse. So in that way. So you're, oh wait, that doesn't show that anything's optimal. That shows that that um, you're at least not so stupid as to tell people the stuff they've already heard. That's, that's all it You You shows. do not tell people the stuff that will appear very surprising to them. So that's a, another sense of optimal, because you want your communication to be more efficient. And uh, well, this is actually a rational process of producing language. Yeah. I, I mean, do not start, start do, the conversation. Do people do these analyses on real discourse, or is this on? I mean, yes, it's on real discourse. The, the, the amount of redundancy and speech errors and stuff like that. I mean, look, let me distinguish two claims here. One is that as a general rule, people tend to follow metrics like give people only surprising information or don't be redundant or whatever. But that if you actually look at real discourse, you will find all kinds of violations of that. that I mean, I think that as a statistical matter, that, that people are relatively efficient. but optimally efficient in any of those terms, I, I really sincerely doubt it. Well, Maybe. there's a difference. If, you, if, you're, if the discourse is not that optimal, when you measure that with statistics, that discourse also tend to be more difficult for people to understand it. So think of it. That I believe. I mean, sure. I mean, the, the, le the further you stray from the optimal principles in your language, the tougher it's going to be for people to understand it. I have no problem with that whatsoever, but my claim is that empirically, people can't sort of tack that like a, you know, a sailboat perfectly following the wind. That they, that they can come close, but they, they can't come perfect. I mean, read undergraduate term papers for an hour, and you will see how poor people that are above the mean in SAT math and SAT verbal are at actually constructing discourse that follows these properties. Take, take one example, right? A, a, a pragmatically sophisticated creature would not introduce um, a subject without having a clear antecedent. You know, maybe Hopkins students are better than NYU students. You know, probably their mean SATs are better and it's a little bit better. But I'm going to guess that they have lots of problems with that as an illustration. We could take many others where, where people don't actually construct their discourses in optimal ways, which is why, you know, um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell gets a million dollars to write a book because he knows how to do that stuff. And the average person you know, writes text messages that nobody else understands, you know. So I'm exaggerating slightly, but you get the idea. Yeah. Going back to your idea of treelets, yeah. that just reminds me a lot of uh, the right of, of work doing right corner transforms and doing right corner parsing, uh, where you end up with constituents that look like an S lacking a BP. OK, so sort of like GPS. I don't know the term, but. Uh, it, well, it, it, we, maybe we should talk about, about that, but yeah, it, it, where you can do, you come up with these sub-constituents that yeah. you've already recognized something, and you know you still have something left. So I mean, there are GPS G things, at least in that spirit, right? You have a subject lack, or you just, yeah, a subject lacking, or, or maybe a sentence lacking a subject or something like that. Yeah, it's the other way around, though. It's a, but yeah, okay. yeah something like that. Okay. The, the other thing that just struck me is that these questions about, well, if you model, if you came up with a language if you, if you wanted to come up with a, a system for recognizing this language, it would look like this. It, it sort of seems like the backward way of looking at it, at, at least from my from, uh, NLP and AI background, or background, it's kind of backwards. I mean, it's, you've got a system. What's the appropriate model for that system? Well, OK, so um, I'm, these two questions are different enough. I'm not going to keep them both in my head. 
Um, the first one uh, about this sort of, I'm, I'm calling it, um, I had something. See, I knew I was going to lose something. Um, the, I had something I wanted to say. Well, I'll go to the second question and maybe come back to this. Um, in terms of the system, I mean, I think there, there are different things that we can do. Ah, I know the first. Treelet. Um, treelets are even, the, the, Joshi has treelets that are even closer than, than, um, the, than your right corner parsers to what I have. And what I would say is that what I have is a sort of extreme, like they talk about extreme skiing. I have extreme treelets, right? I mean, I think that the form of representation is something like what Joshi is talking about and might have some affinity with what you're talking about. Um, and what's making this an interesting claim is two parts. One is the evolutionary argument for why you should expect it, and the other is the extremity of it saying that's all there is, right? So for Joshi, ultimately you've got a full tree. I'm saying you never get there, except maybe by chunking for like, you know, idioms or sentences you see a lot or something. So it's, it's the motivation and the extremeness that, that makes it different. On the second point, I mean, there's sort of reverse engineering or forward engineering or something like that. Um, I would say that I'm just asking a different question, right? I'm asking a question of why does the system have the properties that it does? If I wanted to build a parser that is faithful to human beings, then I would do the kind of stuff that I'm doing now. If I wanted to build a parser that was really fast, I might not, or really something. I mean, so, I mean, com everybody thinks, every, you, probably not you, but every naive person thinks, well, computers don't understand language. How on earth could you be saying that they're better um, a language. And of course, it's because they can do one thing better and another thing not better, right? The thing they can do better is actually parsing, right? Computers don't really have a whole lot. I mean, there's some disambiguation stuff, so I'm, maybe they're making it oversimplified. But I mean, computers can see a tree and tell you what the po possible parses of it are. They don't have trouble with that. They have problems using stuff to disambiguate, and they have no good you know, semantic representations and so forth. So it's like, you know, if there's 10 steps involved in language, it's only like the first step, storing the sentence in a properly formed tree that they're better at. They are, I think, better at that. Um, and they're, you know, they're worse at the rest of it because they don't have any you know, pragmatics or common sense or anything like that. But I think that they probably are better at the, the basics of, of parsing a tree. So if you're building an engineering system, you have to ask yourself, am I building this so that it understands the mistakes people do? Like if you're building a, set, a system that understands speech and you, know, you want to get rid of the outsourcing to India and, and have c machines do all of the customer service, um, because the Indian stuff doesn't work badly enough, and no, um, I shouldn't have said that out loud. Um, then, then you know, you might want it to understand the mistakes that people make. So you might want to understand why people start and stop at particular places, why why they interrupt themselves, why they put in resumptive pronouns they're not supposed to be. In that case, you'd want to know the kind of stuff that I'm doing. On the other hand, you might want something that parses, you know, billions of sentences of running text. And you might say, I don't care that people deviate from you know the ideal in this respect, and it's not. You know, it's not my problem. So I think there it just depends on what problem you're trying to solve. Um, I, I actually think uh, we may want to uh, cut our questions out. As Gary says, he'll be around for the rest of the afternoon if anyone wants to uh, talk. All right. Well, thank you all very much. <laughs>